Um, it's been this week Wednesday. Um, so if you have any questions, I guess you can talk to us this morning, um, or you can send us an email. Um, hopefully this one uh, was meant not to be as long. Hopefully it didn't be as long as, as the other ones. Um, also, I'm, I've been handing back the project reports. I think I handed back the project report for everyone who or one of the partners is here. If you haven't gotten it, it's, um, um, you can see me after class. Um, so far, up to this point, the, the things for the project, I've been giving grades mainly on um, whether you follow the procedure so far. So if you if you followed all the things you were supposed to report, then you got full marks without without going over the page limit. Um, so if uh, and uh, but in the in the next part is the largest chunk is the final report, and in that one I will actually look at you know um, I'll actually look at how much work you did. Um, did you do something more interesting, um, and so forth. And, and I think most of you are on good track um, to do very well in this. Um, actually, a lot of you um, have already done a lot of work towards the final project. Um, so make sure you, you know, spend time explaining the results more clearly, um, explaining whether you think you found something interesting or not, um, and kind of going into more detail instead of just showing a chart without really explaining as much. Um, and uh, in in most cases, I would you know I'd like to give everyone on the project the same grade. Um, and uh, but in a, in a few cases, you know, it seemed that um, how you had broken up um, the project was important, and some people seem not to have done as much work yet. Um, sometimes this is because there was more data processing earlier on, and that person was going to do more of the analysis in the later part, and that's fine. Um, you haven't lost any points at this point for this, but if, if it stays like this on the final project, individual members may not score as well as the rest of the team. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, and so again, if you have any questions about the, uh, um, about the project or um, what you should be working on uh, for the project or the directions or you can't read the, the, the feedback they've given you, um, please con just Please talk to me after the class in my office hours, or if that doesn't work, send me an email and we'll find some things. Um, okay, so um, last week on Wednesday, I we talked about compressed sensing and the uh, orthogonal matching pursuit algorithm, and and I and uh, one thing I regret that I didn't do was to uh, was to go through an example. Um, so I'm going to do just a quick one now. Um, of how this works. Um, so, uh, if you remember, how it worked is that there was some uh, there was some signal which we did not have access to. This was S, and it was sparse, so it was mainly zeros, right? And there were a few ones in it, and generally this works if your data is a is a fairly bigger than this. But just for purpose, I'll go to the example. It only has two ones out of five, but you could think maybe it only has ten ones out of um, like a thousand something like that would be you know, a very good use case for this. Um, and so then there was this, this, uh, uh, um, this random uh, measurement matrix where each element of it was, a, was either a 0, a 1, um, or a minus 1. These are chosen at random. You can, you can have other types of measurement matrices, but this one is the easiest to, um, is, is the easiest to work with. And then you, so this is something you did. So you have access to x, and you also get the output of this matrix, which is a value. So if you take s times this top row, then the dot product is this value here, this one. Okay, and you don't have access to s because you're trying to recover it. Um, so so the orthogonal matching pursuit is this greedy algorithm of trying to do this. And so let's see. Um, so um, is it, so. First thing you do is you look for the largest value in this column. Um, it turns out that there's a three-way tie. Um, so let's take just this first one. Um, so this one is the largest. And what we're going to try and do is pick one of these columns of this matrix corresponding with one of the entries of this vector S, which we think best explains this value here. Okay, so there's a one here. 
And so if there's a positive one, this is the largest absolute value, then we're, we should pick one of the larger values here. And in this case, there, there are two of these ones. There's a minus one and two zeros. The zeros aren't explaining anything. The minus one is going the opposite here. And then we can pick one of these, these positive ones. So, um, so since I know what the answer is, I'll happen to choose the right one. But you can see how you could happen to choose the wrong one as well. Um, and so you have this, so I'm going to choose this one here to try and guess um, what this value is. So my guess for the one the entries is that this value has something in it. And so, this, so then I want to solve for a, of a vector that looks like 0, 0, gamma, 0. Solve for this gamma, which is going to give the best estimate of this one here. And that's going to be with this gamma equal to 1. If I do 1, if I do 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, dotted with this, I explain this right here. Um, so this is, is my guess. So now what I do is I'm going to, um, so in, in, instead of y, I'm, I'm going to subtract out the residual of everything I got left. Um, so if I take this, um, this vector, call it S1, and I dot it with this, I'm, so then x, S1, is, is going to be, um, let's call this y1, um, this is going to be um, uh, 1, in this case it's uh, 0, minus 1, and 1, and, I, and then I'm going to have uh, my residual vector as r equals y minus y1, and and, um, and here this is going to be um, equal to um, 0, 1, minus 1, and 0. Okay, so now this is R. Um, this is my residual. And now I need to find the, the maximum absolute value of any of these entries. And I keep doing it. And this will guide me towards my next guess of what one of these entries is going to be positive. And, um, and so let's, I could take, um, let's see, let's say I take, um, let's say I take um, this one. This, these have the same absolute value. So I could have taken either of these, but let's say I take this, this row here. And so then I want to find which of these values, of these four values, best explains this one. Or I guess here now it's, it's this one. Um, and I could pick either of these two. The zeros don't tell me anything. The minus one goes the opposite. Either of these ones could explain it. If I guessed this one, then I'm going to um, um, the, then I'm going to guess some sort of matrix S two, which is going to look like zeros um, zero gamma zero zero zero. And I need to guess what this value of gamma is which best explains um, um, this residual matrix. And my guess, again, is going to be 1 here. And now if I look at this um, S1 plus S2, and I then um, take this dotted with, the, um, with this X matrix, it's I'm going to get a Y2, um, which is going to be X um, S1 plus S2. And the, the output is should be all zeros if I did this correct. Right? So um, this one gets a, or it, it, it should be exactly this y, not all zeros. So this one gets a 1, a 1, a 1, and a minus 1, which is 0, and a 1 here. Um, so, so this y2 is going to be y, uh, 1, 1, 0, 1. And, and if I um, subtract, and then if I do y minus y2, then this is going to be equal to the residual, which is going to be 0, 0, 0, 0. And I know at this point I can stop. OK, so this was the orthogonal managing pursuit algorithm we talked about on the end of class on, on Wednesday. And so I didn't go through an example, so that's what, um, so that's what this is.
So as, as you can see, there were some choices. And if I had chosen the wrong, um, if I had chosen the wrong guess, if I had chosen um, at some point, if I had chosen a, a say this column instead of this column, then I would have gotten the wrong result. So this 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 algorithm um, it sometimes works well, but it can run into, into some problems. And so for the homework, the next homework, which is just posted, the the bonus part is is to go through and and, and run this on and um, on some actual data set. And it should be such that you should be able to do pretty you should be able to get the right answer. Um, but in some cases, it won't. And so what we're going to talk about um, today is the lasso. Um, um, so the lasso is, is generally, we'll talk about it in the context of uh, um, doing L1 regression um, or uh, regression with, uh, with the L1 regularizer. Um, but it can also be used for solving this compressed sensing problem. And uh, the last one were some slight variants of it where you're doing some rounding of certain steps. Um, turns out to be uh, uh, really one of the state of the art techniques for solving these problems. And it will not get stuck in local minimum the same way that um, the orthogonal matching pursuit will as well. Or it, it won't allow you to make these wrong decisions and it'll, um, it'll help you get out of them. If you, if you get into it. So, but we will mainly be talking about it um, in terms of um, the regression problem. Um, and so the problems won't look exactly the same, but they should look pretty similar. So you should um, keep that in mind as we're, as we're going through this. Okay, so um, to, um, to remind everyone um, what the regression problem is, is that you have some data points um, and these, these data points lie, um, let's, let's call these data points P, and they're going to lie in, a, um, in some d-dimensional space. Here I've drawn them in, in a two-dimensional space. And there's going to be one axis, there's going to be one axis of the space which is going to be um, it's going to be more important um, than all the other axes. This is the one that you actually care about measuring. And so what we're doing is we're finding some um, some um, some line which is trying to represent these points. And what you want to do is to minimize um, the sum of these squared distances, and in particular, the distance in this, um, um, in particular, the distance in this y direction. So we talked about PCA, and that was measuring the distance that's projecting orthogonal onto the subspace. This one, all we care about is this, um, in particular, is this y direction. And so then you also have d minus 1 of these other dimensions here, x, um, which will describe x. And in, and in fact, um, so, 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 so there, um, yeah, so, um, um, so if you just solve this in, um, it, we talked before, you just solve this in, in, in two dimensions, then you can, you can, um, you can solve this with just some algebra. If you're in higher dimensional space, then this, then this x, you can think of this uh, as representing a, um, a, a matrix describing all the x coordinates of all the points, right? And, and so this x, this x matrix is going to look like um, this, where there are um, d, uh, where there are d minus one dimensions here, and um, and each of the rows. Um, um, so each of the rows corresponds to a point, and so we'll say that maybe there are um, there are n of these points, um, and so you can write this data in this matrix form here, and then what you want to do is solve for this this line, and this line you can write um, as as this function a, where you take in um, some. Um, some vector x, 
Um, and, and what you do is you, uh, you're going to do the sum from i equals 0 to d of a0 to x, or ai um, times xi. So, um, so this is going to be a, um, so this is a linear function in the, in the coordinates of x. Um, so this is, um, um, so this is the d minus one dimensional vector. But if you notice here, I'm summing uh, over d plus one things here. Um, so, so actually I want to do to d minus one because there are only d minus one coordinates here. But then I still start at zero. Um, and so what you can do is you can, you can take this, this, uh, this, this matrix X and make, make it so the first row is, is, is all ones. And so then it's, um, so then this is D dimensional. And so then if you don't do this, then this red line must always go through the origin. But if you have these ones, then, then this first part is telling you an offset here. And you're, and you're allowing your line not to go through the origin. Um, so the point is that you can take your data, you can transform it into this, this matrix X, and now you can solve for um, this, uh, this, this equation, which is describing this line. So for any X coordinate, you can correspond with a, a location on this, on this line, or a set of X coordinates. You can go to a location on this line, and that's what this is describing. Okay, um, so so then you have this vector a, you have this vector a, um, which is is going to be these um, these coordinates here, a zero, a one, up to a <coughs> a d minus one. So you have these coordinates, and, and you want to solve for these coordinates here, and so as we mentioned before, there's a very simple way how to solve for these. Um, you can set A equals to, um, make sure this right, um, X transpose X, um, this is inverse, um, X transpose um, times Y. And so Y is, is the vector of these, these Y coordinates of these points. Okay, so if you've got your data organized this way, you can just kind of essentially type this into MATLAB and this will solve for the city square solution. So just a reminder of how to interpret this, this inverse is essentially an operation where you're dividing by this. Um, and we'll come back with some intuition about this, use this for some intuition in later. But this, this operation of dividing is the most expensive part. It corresponds to taking the, the inverse of the matrix. Um, Alright, so, um, so this is the least square solution. Um, as um, Um, so this is the least squares. What this does is it um, it finds um, the um, the a um, which solves min um, is is the argument of um, y minus f of a of this x here. Um, So if this is the day set, then you, uh, this is um, the y coordinate of p minus um, f of a of the, of the x coordinates of, of this point set p squared. So, so, this is, so this is the solution which is minimizing the sum 
of these squared distances, and that corresponds to these squared vertical distances here. Um, so, so just to point this out one more time, the PCA we talked about looked at the closest projection onto this line, where this is looking at the distance of the y coordinate. Um, so why would you want to use this orthogonal distance instead of the distance to the line which is closer to it? Why would you only care about this y distance? Um, okay, so, uh, um, so one answer is if you think that x has no air in it, right? Um, so this is, this is built into the model, um, but this is kind of maybe a, maybe a downside of the model. Um, so th if you think that x has no air, into it, air in it, then, then that's probably right. Then your projection on here only cares about this vertical distance. But x probably has air in it, um, air in it anyways, but we're, but we're probably just going to ignore this fact. And, and most, and when I've, I guess when I've talked to actual statisticians about this and I ask them, you know, what if x is air in it, they're like, oh yeah, that's, that's something we kind of brush under the rug. But, but, but that's not the reason why they use least squares instead of PCA. Um, but that is a good, good thing to keep in mind. Uh, because it's easy, okay. So it's easy, yeah, you can just do this, but it's arguably, you know, no easier than doing something like PCA as well. Um, so you can just take the top singular vector of, uh, after taking the SVD, and that gives you also, also a line, or right? taking the top D minus one, and this gives you a half space, uh, this linear projection. Um, so I, th I think the main reason is that often this y coordinate is is really is the important is the important aspect here. This this may correspond to there are a bunch of attributes and this y coordinate says how much money are you making off of it, right? Or some utility function. This is all you care about. This is all the data you collected, and you'd like to predict this value based on this data, right? So with the PCA, you're trying to find the overall structure of the data. This is you're trying to um, predict this all important value. Okay, um, that's one reason. So because the, um, so you you only care about this value. And secondly, when you're dealing with PCA, I, a few of you have run into this in your in your um, in, in your projects that certain of the attributes seem to be numbers which are much larger than the, than the other attributes. And so when you're doing PCA, these tend to dominate which, which tend to have the most variance in them, just because the numbers are larger. They have more variation in them. Um, here, it's, it really, you're basically saying a relationship between um, whatever the scaling is here and why. You don't have to worry about how the scaling um, is a, is a, it corresponds to why. You still find this best relationship. So you don't have to worry about one of the one of the coordinates being scaled, you know, uh, a thousand times more than the other ones, it, it still factors out what is the right, you know, uh, what is the right relationship between them for predicting this value. Uh, um, so these, uh, these are the aspects why you want to use something like this uh, least squares instead of something like this. Okay. Um, all right. So. The other thing we mentioned, I guess this was almost, I guess this was before break, so like three weeks ago, we talked about um, ridge regression. Um, this is also known as um, peak in uh, um, regularization. Um, and so this is a very similar to it's very similar to solving for this. Um, uh, this. So before I move on, let me just rewrite this in a slightly different way. If you if, if you have a, a, a vector y, let's see, if you have a vector y with with all of the y coordinates, this is um, y p one, y p two, um, and then we already had these this this. Uh, 
this X matrix and this A, then you can you can solve for this. This is the same way as writing um, Y minus X A, and then you took the two normal square. So you can write this in the matrix notation as well. Okay, so th this will be more compact than writing it as the sum. Um, and if you're implementing it in MATLAB or something, it deals much better with matrices than it does with running a for loop, which you might do as a sum. So if you're using MATLAB or Octave, you want to think about it like this. Okay, so the, um, the ridge regression is, is very similar to least squares, but it finds A, um, which is the argument um, of instead y minus x a squared plus this extra term here. Um, and we can take out the squared. Um, right, so it's got this extra term here, and this term is called a regularization term, and um, this parameter is called the regularizer. Um, so Okay, and the cool thing about um, risk regression is that you can solve this just as easily as you could solve these squares. Instead of using this formula, you use A is equal to X transpose X plus S squared inverse X transpose um, So in order to solve for the optimal A for this parameter S, I just have to plug it inside this inverse. So I can solve it just as easily as here. Of course, now I have to choose this parameter S, right? And I have to understand what this parameter S means. Um, and so that part is a little trickier, but it's going to come back and actually be useful, as we'll see, to have to think about this parameter S. Least squares is, is implicitly when the parameter s is equal to zero. So, you know, you think, okay, least squares doesn't have any parameters in it. Um, well, that's, that's unless you think of using ridge regression and then you arbitrarily chose s to be zero. And maybe s was not the right choice. And maybe zero was not the right choice. Um, so, uh, and we'll, I'll, I'll get more intuition of what about s means and how you choose it. Uh, in this lecture, and then also we'll talk about it more on Wednesday as well, a full-blown full thing of how you choose the value of this. Um, okay, and then finally we get to um, the lasso, which is again very similar here, um, but it's going to find this A, which is the R, and then A, Y minus X, A, plus S. The only difference here is that the lasso uses, uses the one norm and the ridge regression uses the two norm. Okay, and so to, just to be clear, I, I, I know this may be new for some of you, when you say the, the arg min of something is equal to this, that means you're returning the argument, which is A, where if you take the minimum, that's the value. So the argument is is, the, is actually A here. So just in case you're confused about that. Okay. So now when we when we use the one norm instead here, we can no longer solve for A like this. So it seems like you know it's it's just causing us trouble to 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 use the one norm instead of the two norm. Um, so why would we want to use the one norm if we don't have this kind of very clean way of solving for it? Um, so that's what I'm going to explain today. Um, why is it worth using this one norm? And in fact, and also why is it important to use some uh, um, uh, um, some regularizer parameter S? <clears throat> okay, so. When I motivated this last time, I talked about um, regression to the mean. And 
I forget only one or two of you had heard of regression to the mean. Right? Does this um, so, so let me maybe kind of just talk through another example of this, right? Um, um, so who follows, um, so who's been following the basketball tournament, the NCAA basketball tournament, March Madness? Okay, so now I'll try something else. Who's following cricket? Is there a cricket? Okay. Uh, okay, is there any, is there any sporting event you guys have been following? No, no one's a sports fan. Okay, well, I don't play the time on the Premier League like you do something. Okay, Premier League too. Okay, well, that's it's a lower scoring, so it's not as good of an example. Okay, um, okay, so let's use an example of a test instead. This this isn't going to be as much fun as as sports, but because you guys aren't sports fan, you'll have to have to deal with it. Um, so. Is it, um, so, um, okay, um, so there's a test, and it's um, 20 questions, um, and they're true-false, okay? And so, so, it's, so what you're going to do is you're going to have the whole class, um, you know, take um, first 10 um, questions. And so everyone is given, let's say everyone's given, say, a random subset of the 10 questions, okay? And, and everyone has about the same knowledge. They, they're going to they're gonna get, um, maybe everyone, um, it's, it's a pretty hard test. And everyone knows, um, um, everyone knows half the questions. Um, and they are going to guess on what half the questions. Okay. So each individual gets a random sub, a random ten from the twenty. Yeah, or or it could be, or either that or, or or this or which half they know is random. You know. Right. Okay. So something like that. Some that they're they're getting a bunch of very they're going through a similar process, and they're going to know half the questions, and they're going to guess them half. Okay, so, so after we've taken this first half of the test, what we're going to do is we're going to um, look at the top students. The students who've done well so far, right? And so let's say that these top students have, um, have, have averaged 90% um, so far on the test. Right, so if, if you were an average student, what, what do you expect to, to, um, to average on this test? What percentile? Right, so 75, right? Half, half of them, you're going to get it correct. And half of them, you're going to guess, and it's true false, so you have a 50% chance. Right, so you're going to get 50%, 50 out of 50%, and 25 out of this 50%, so that's 75%. So the top students maybe average this 90%. Okay, so let's look at this top set, and now let's say, now everyone takes the second half of the test. Okay, so it's the same thing, where they're going to know, you know, about half the questions, and they're going to guess on about half the questions. How well do you think these top students are going to do in expectation on the second half of the test? So, sorry for the question, so each question is independent of each other. Yeah, okay. so how do you expect them to do on the second half? students, there's, there's a set of top students and they averaged, um, they averaged about 90%. Okay, so let's say that, um, the, so I see we're getting at this and this is more complicated than I anticipated. So let's say that each question is drawn from some huge infinite set of questions and, 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 uh, and each of them the student will know with 50% probability and guess with 50% probability. 
do you want to change your answer or do you, do you like 60? Okay. Does anyone else like 60? No, I'm, I'm, I'm changing my definition when they put 60 in, so probably why not. Okay, so, so who thinks they're going to average 90%? No. No one. Okay. Uh, who thinks we're. Yeah? So your question is uh, for the second round, what's the score, average score for the top students? Yeah. How would it? You put 90. Okay, good. So, so who wants to put? So, only one of you guessed 90. Everyone else needs to guess something else. 70. What? 70. 70 percent. Okay, who thinks 70 percent? I think. Would you just say the question again? Okay, so you have a you have a test with 20 questions. Each question, either they're gonna. Each question is drawn at random from some infinite set. Um, and with the percent, the student is going to know it. And with with uh, um, with 50 percent, they're not going to know it, and it's true false, so they're going to guess. Okay. And and I I I looked at the first half of the test, and these students, and I looked at the top students, and they averaged 90 percent. They got nine out of ten correct. So how do you expect this? These just these top students to do on the rest of the test. I mean, every every student has the same heuristic. I mean, it just gets randomly so well, so percent and each time they take a test is independent of another. So right. It, uh, to me, it seems like they could be poor students the next time, or they could be good students. So what would you expect them to do? Seventy-five percent. Seventy-five percent. Any other guesses? I hear eighty or what? Eighty. Okay, so who wants 75? Who wants who wants 80? Okay. So the right answer is gonna be 75. Okay, so so every student used the same process to do this. Just because they did well at the beginning does not mean they're gonna do well on the rest of the test. And so you if you look at their averages. You expect the overall average on their 20 on all 20 questions to be the average of the 90% and the 75%. You, you expect it to regress to the mean, and, and so this is what it means by uh, regressing to the mean. Okay. So so if if I was giving a